Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining uh, the Climax uh, seminar series. This is the last Thank seminar you. of uh, 2022, I believe. I don't think we're having one on Christmas Day or anything like that. That would be a bit much. Um, so, uh, so this is the last seminar, and we're we're really pleased to have two um, amazing guests on uh, on basically carbon uh, and chemistry of soils and their implications. We're just going to wait um, maybe just a couple of minutes before we 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 start completely. Um, maybe I'll start by um, just outlining what our uh, who our seminar speakers are. So I'll just introduce them very briefly. Um, so we are first going to be hearing from Professor Marco Kailuvait, Kailu sorry, I did practice, but I got it wrong. So Professor Marco Kailuvait, who's a colleague uh, at the Faculty of Geosciences and Environment of UNIL. Uh, he's interested in how carbon and nutrients uh, cycles in soil and sediment respond to climate and land use change. Uh, he completed his PhD at Oregon State University and was a postdoc at Stanford University and then an assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, he's now an associate professor of soil biogeochemistry at UNIL. Uh, Marco is particularly interested in the fundamental geochemical processes, biotically bio mediated or not, that regulate carbon and nutrient cycles in soils. His research combines laboratory, greenhouse, and field experiments with advanced analytic tools such as synchrotron spectroscopy, uh, chemical imaging, and molecular microbiology. His group's work links fine-scale biogeochemical mechanisms to landscape-scale processes within natural and managed ecosystems. So Marco Kailovait has acquired numerous grants and has received several prestigious awards, including a Lawrence Scholar and an NSF Early Career Award. Um, and he is going to be telling us about mapping carbon flow through soils, ecosystem, and global impacts. And I think it's very exciting. So um, I'll present Professor Merit Epley from EPFL um, before her talk. But I think it's very exciting that we have two talks on this topic of um, soil chemistry, carbon cycle in soils, and biogeochemical elements all together. So I think it's going to be a really exciting talk. And I'm learning, looking forward to learning a lot myself. So uh, with that, I think we can uh, give the screen to um, Marco, and maybe one of the things I can just say is that the uh, Climax talks are recorded and then posted online on YouTube, um, and I think Sharmali has the links ready to go probably. So, uh, and Marco, if you can talk for about 20 minutes, and then we'll have some time for questions, and then it will be Merit's turn. Off we go. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming, and thank you, Julia, for this kind introduction. Um, I chose to give a somewhat broad talk on broader than I'm used to um, on on soil carbon cycling, um, its role in the global carbon cycle uh, more broadly, and um, by association, its impact on on the climate system. And um, there's really a lot of interest as evidenced in um, in the seminar series here in soils more recently because of its role in the uh, carbon cycle, and I can't figure out my buttons. But because of its role in the car uh, global carbon cycle. And um, just as a reminder, soil carbon is really the largest and the most dynamic um, terrestrial carbon pool we know of. And um, it amounts to roughly twice as much carbon as um, we store in the biosphere and the atmosphere combined. There's obviously lots of talk about carbon in the atmosphere. And the the form of CO2, um, but there really is a massive amount of carbon in soils. And we discover more and more carbon in soils, especially in the colder climates, and those numbers um, tend to go up over time. And um, this carbon pool is dynamic because it's continuously replenished through plant inputs, biological process, uh, and it's continuously lost through uh, biological process, microbial respiration, decomposition. And those fluxes in and out of um, soils constitute a pretty significant portion of the global carbon cycle. Those nine numbers are huge compared to um, what we are normally concerned about, which are the anthropogenic emissions of, of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. 
And so that soil carbon um, is stored in soils uh, in the form not of these juicy orange carrots, but in the form of basically dirt, um, amorphous, dark organic matter, um, <clears throat> all kinds of different compounds. It's probably the most complex organic mixture um, on the planet. It's very difficult to analyze. Um, but because it's these inputs of carbon and the outputs are mediated essentially by biological processes. They respond really um, dramatically to environmental change. And so as a consequence of that, soil carbon not only responds to climate change, but also drives climate change. So when we um, think about warming uh, temperatures around the world, soil temperature tends to increase microbial activity in soils and leads to greater greenhouse gas emissions. Similarly, elevated CO2 concentrations, you might think elevated CO2 concentrations makes plants happy, they grow better. But for some reason, increased plant productivity tends to also destabilize the organic matter from soils and increase greenhouse gas emissions. So there are a number of these so-called soil carbon climate feedbacks that people have been trying to understand and wrap their head around for the last 20 or so years uh, that are quite complicated and complex, but interesting to study. To give you an idea of the magnitude of these um, uh, soil carbon feedbacks that we might potentially expect over the ne next 100 years, Margaret Thorne, a staff scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in the US, uh, once plotted anthropogenic emission emissions projected over the next 100 years against these um, estimated uh, soil carbon feedbacks. And while these fluxes are actually quite low relative to the massive fluxes in and out of soils naturally, um, those feedbacks um, are pretty, pretty significant when you compare them to um, anthropogenic emissions. And so worth, worth studying. And of course, soil carbon loss has other consequences um, besides uh, impacts on the climate si system. For example, um, our ability to grow uh, food and produce um, and feed our, our populations. Uh, biodiversity is directly tied to soil organic carbon in many soils. Uh, and of course, water quality, soils as filters uh, depend a lot on organic matter within our soils. Um, and many soils globally have a strong link between soil organic matter that is stored in those soils, or soil organic carbon, and productivity. And because we've seen declines in soil organic carbon uh, globally um, as, a fun as a result of agricult uh, agricultural practices, uh, we've also seen a pretty substantial decline in um, productivity within those agricultural systems. And this is just showing you the decline over the last 25 years. Um, not really accounted for uh, the massive declines we've seen prior to that. So as I mentioned earlier, um, very briefly, um, the soil carbon cycle really is a balance between soil carbon inputs through plant materials and soil out carbon outputs in the form of primarily greenhouse gases such as CO2. Um, some of those inputs are, and the, really the balance is regulated um, by um, microbial processes such as mineral, mineralization that takes these um, plant inputs and mineralizes them back to um, greenhouse gas emissions. So that mineralization rate uh, really dictates um, whether we are uh, crewing carbon or accumulating carbon uh, in soils or whether we are um, experiencing a net loss. And in a relatively undisturbed system before the dawn of industrial agriculture, we had relatively stable carbon contents in soils. Um, but with the onset of um, more intense management, we've seen um, pretty steady declines in carbon uh, contents in soils globally. And that is due to um, diminishing inputs, right? We are removing crops. We are not leaving them in the soils. We're taking carbon out of the system every, every uh, harvest season. Uh, but it also has to do with erosion and uh, tillage practices that break up the soil in a way that enhances mineralization of carbon, so um, increases losses. And if we continue business as usual, um, that um, will result in further carbon losses from soils. But there's lots of motivation now, thankfully, to try to implement management practices that will restore some of these carbon pools in soils. Um, <clears throat> so how could one do that? Quite simply speaking, we can increase uh, organic inputs in soils. There's lots of um, restorative 
agricultural practices that try to do that. Um, or we can try to adopt management strategies that reduce the mineralization of uh, the organic matter pools and so on, minimizing losses through greenhouse gases. Um, when we think about optimizing soil function for carbon storage, though, we have to really keep in mind that we also want a productive system. And productivity often depends on the cycling of organic matter, the cycling of nutrients, the microbially uh, driven liberation of nutrients from organic matter uh, that we also need to allow in order to maintain productivity of our system. So it's not always an easy answer in a given soil system to say, okay, we want to optimize for soil carbon storage and we want to optimize for productive ecosystems. It's not always the same thing. So we as um, land managers ultimately have to decide what our priority is for the system. And then, of course, there's this uncertainty regarding climate change effects on the soil carbon um, walls. And overall, we expect them to further decline as a function of climate drivers. Um, some background noise, maybe um, yeah. could mute themselves. Um, but there's great uncertainty um, regarding those losses. And we don't really know, for example, how inputs into soils change as a function of elevated CO2 concentrations, but mostly we don't understand how the mineralization rate is going to be impacted by climate change drivers. But that is really important to figure out what the controls are on this mineralization rate. So if you want to manage our lands sustainably, if you want to increase carbon storage within soils, or even if you just simply want to uh, understand the, the role of soils in a global climate system. Um, and over the last 20 or so years, there's really been a quite contentious debate over what the dominant controls are on the mineralization rates of soils. Um, and traditionally, and that's really still um, textbook knowledge these days, um, it's been assumed that um, molecular structure of the inputs really matter when it comes to building up the st stable carbon pool. So the idea here is that um, depending on the chemistry or the molecular structure of the inputs, um, they last longer or shorter in soils. And there are, that there are compounds such as lignin that's really abundant in wood that looks like that and is really difficult to degrade from microbes, would persist in soils for hundreds and thousands of years and build the stable carbon pool. It's a quite simple idea. That's just stuff that people, uh, microbes don't like to eat and that accumulate in soils over time. But that view really has been called in question uh, lately by a number of different studies, high profile studies. Um, I always like to show these data here that show residence times of different compound classes in soils. Um, comparing things like lignin um, that we normally think of very recalcitrant wood, wood derived um, compounds um, to proteins and sugars that we normally perceive as fairly uh, yummy to microbes. Um, and you see that the residence time of lignin is actually quite a bit shorter than that of protein and, and, and sugars in soils sort of toppling that idea that molecular structure or the perceived recalcitrance really dictates how long uh, organic matter persists in soils. And so over the last few years, there's been put forward a few different mechanisms um, by which um, people assume we can build up the stable carbon pool and sequester carbon uh, within soils. And um, probably the most um, the, the, the reigning paradigm, if you will, is mineral protection. And uh, that really describes the idea that there are organic compounds um, that bind to reactive minerals in soils that are really abundant. Soils are mostly minerals, they are weathering products that create these reactive minerals that have lots of surfaces that can bind organic matter. And then when organic matter binds to these mineral surfaces, it becomes unavailable to microbes. And that's ultimately how we sequester carbon in soils. So again, this is sort of the reigning paradigm. More recently, there's been lots of talk about metabolic limitations on microbial activity that I think Merit may be talking about a little bit. Um, so that's an interesting topic that people are studying, but really the reigning paradigm is if you want to lock carbon up in soils, you get it to bind to minerals and that's the end of story. And then you can have carbon emphasis for a long time. So my group um, tends to focus on 
Um, the following three questions, we are interested in identifying what the mechanisms are that control carbon cycling. Uh, we try to understand how vulnerable these mechanisms are to climate and land use change. And uh, we are spe specifically interested in uh, the raw of minerals. So I mentioned earlier that one potential way to increase carbon sequestration is to increase plant inputs. And there's been this really interesting observation that because of elevated CO2 concentrations, um, primary productivity in many ecosystems goes up, plants just grow better and there's more CO2 for them to fix, um, resulting in more root carbon inputs. And so you would assume that could be a good thing, right? You could store more carbon in soils as a consequence of these inputs. But what is sort of the mystery of um, terrestrial ecosystem ecology is that these root carbon inputs actually cause a disproportionate loss of carbon uh, from soils. So those losses amount to more than the inputs, creating a net uh, loss of carbon from, from soils. And that number looks kind of small when you think about it, when you, but when you calculate that on a per hectare basis, it's about a metric ton of crude oil uh, per hectare um, that you're losing every year. So uh, it's kind of been a baffling observation why root impacts um, not increase carbon storage, but deplete carbon storage. And part of the reason why we don't really understand this is that there's a lack of mechanistic information about how root impacts, roots impact um, the, the so carbon balance. And so I'm just going to show you a couple of uh, studies that we did in my group um, trying to understand how carbon flows through the system here and what the role of roots are. And if you want to follow roots uh, and root carbon through soils, one really nice way of doing that is to uh, use stable isotope, uh, stable isotope labeling. And we can um, label entire plants for 13 C that we, we can then trace into roots and into the adjacent soils. And we can use different chemical uh, imaging techniques to look at the soil particles next to the root. Um, and, define its chemistry, the mineralogy, as well as the, the type of organic matter that we find within um, tiny little aggregates. Um, and then we can also use imaging techniques such as the nanosense that we have uh, here downstairs in, in Geopolis, managed by Anders Meibom, um, to map where the 13 C went, where that root derived, ultimately root derived um, carbon C went. And so when we do this on a bunch of different um, aggregates, um, in one study, we were able to nicely show that that um, plant-derived carbon uh, preferentially accumulates on iron-bearing um, minerals. And I believe Merit will talk about that a little more. Uh, but the observation that all this root carbon preferentially absorbs to these iron oxide minerals was pretty, pretty interesting to us. We can also use chemical tools to then uh, describe the signature of that organic matter to figure out if it still looks like that root material or if it has been processed microbially. And what we found is that not only did this root carbon um, associated with minerals preferentially become preserved there, it had also undergone chemical transformations that in, imply that they're actually microbial products now. So instead of just root carbon directly slurping onto these minerals, there has been some microbial processing and microbial products then accumulated on these minerals. So root carbon doesn't seem to be recalcitrant, but it accumulates because it is um, bound to these minerals. But then we all know, or those of you who um, grow plants at home know that they need nutrients and they have developed um, different mechanisms by which they can scavenge soils for nutrients. Um, for example, different reactive exudates that they re release in a soil. And they're specifically designed to dissolve minerals, such as those iron bearing minerals that uh, we just talked about in order to access nutrients. So one of the questions that we had um, for root impacts is how do these exudates then impact all this organic matter that's stored on these minerals? Um, and we designed a study where we basically just um, used these fake roots to um, pump exudates into soils and then observe their effect on these minerals with the organic carbon pool. And what we found is that um, not only did these different exudate compounds dissolve these iron-bearing minerals, they led to a proportionate loss of carbon 
And we were again able to use these imaging techniques that I described to uh, verify that that carbon loss is directly associated with um, the destabilization of this mineral organic mineral associated carbon core. So we are stripping carbon off of these minerals, um, they, it becomes bioavailable again and is lost from the system. So roots have this interesting um, impact on soil carbon dynamics in that they obviously provide the source of inputs um, that then are microbially processed and ultimately can um, be protected by minerals. But they at the same time destabilize this mineral associated organic matter pool. Um, and so, so what, what is really interesting is that this stable carbon pool is not as stable as we maybe want to think of it as, you know, is this really a way to sequester carbon if you are constantly replenishing this pool and constantly destabilizing this pool? Um, maybe we should think of this pool more dynamic and the direct implication here is that uh, it might be more vulnerable to um, environmental change than we previously thought. And um, as I mentioned earlier, there are various mechanisms that people um, have put forward that um, are meant to explain the accumulation of the stable carbon pool. And it is quite likely that many of them operate at the same time um, and so simultaneously. Um, but I would say that our research and research by others um, has shown that any one of these mechanisms is really um, only operating as long as the environmental conditions are, are right. Uh, so for example, molecular structure, uh, we and others have shown really only matters in the absence of oxygen. If oxygen is pre present, molecular uh, structure or recalcitrance of organic material doesn't matter as much and many compounds are being degraded. Um, and loss from the soil. Mineral protection, as I just showed you, matters if um, there are no roots around, but if there's ac active mining by plant roots, maybe it doesn't matter so much anymore. And then metabolic limitations only matter so much as those limitations persist. And as soon as environmental conditions things change that might alleviate those limitations, um, that carbon might not be so stable anymore. So that sort of raises the question, how useful is it really to think about stable carbon and carbon sequestration as this really, really stable pool that we accumulate in soils when it really tend, seems to be much more dynamic. Um, and maybe one way to think about this that um, might yield better results conceptually is to really think about it as um, uh, carbon storage as a function of the present environmental conditions in a given soil environment. And the direct implication of this sort of slight change in perspective here is that um, we have to recognize that the factors that control mineralization rates and therefore carbon storage within the within soils can vary depending on where we are in the soil system, whether we are in a rhizosphere, whether there's active roots um, doing their thing all the time, as I just described, or whether we are down deep in the soil profile where we have um, the water table change all the time and um, all the resource availability. Um, it also changes how we view carbon cycling within different ecosystems. Um, environmental conditions are vastly different depending on whether I am in a um, tropical forest soil versus an agricultural soil somewhere in Switzerland. And therefore the, the controls on the mineralization rates will be quite different and might have different susceptibility to climate change and land use change. And that's really the important part is that if you focus on um, carbon persistence within a soil ecosystem being an ecosystem property, it really drives home the point that um, climate and land use change will have a massive impact on these carbon stocks and they can't really be considered stable um, no matter what happens. And so my, my um, advice usually to my students is to think more about um, soil carbon um, flows through the system rather than these stable pools. And maybe when we think about how we manage our soils, we should think less about how we sequester carbon and how we build the stable carbon pool than about how we can manage flows in a, in a, um, in a way that maximizes um, ecosystem benefits, for example, carbon storage, for example, productivity. And I think that's much closer to reality of how soils function than uh, this idea that there's sort of the stable carbon pool that persists forever. <laughs>
Um, and I just want to leave you with a quote by Salman Baxman, who um, is a Nobel laureate who studied soils. Um, also discovered, discovered um, streptomycin on the side, uh, but who really to form this point that we need to focus on the dynamics of the system rather than this static pool of carbon that um, really only exists in our imagination. Thanks. So let me just uh, briefly present Professor Mary Epley. She's professor at the Soil Biogeochemistry Laboratory of ENIAC EPFL. Before joining EPFL, Merritt was a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University in the Department of Earth System Science from 2019 to 2022. She holds a bachelor's and master's degree in environmental sciences from ETH Zurich and obtained her PhD from ETH Zurich in 2018. And it's a great pleasure to hear her talk on electron transfer reactions in soils, implications for biogeochemical element cycling, and there'll be time for questions for her and sort of joint discussion um, at the end. Thank you so much, Merit. Um, thank you, Julia, for this nice introduction. And thanks for having me here um, today. And also thanks to Marco for an uh, excellent soil introduction. So I hope I can provide some more insights on some uh, specific chemical uh, reactions that I'm studying in my research. So to get started, um, I want to show you two photos of the alleged glacier from the mid 1800s and then the second one from 2018. And you probably saw uh, or you're used to seeing many of these types of images that show um, glacier retreats due to a warming climate. But what I want, to, um, want you to focus on here is not only the retreat of the glacier, but also the change in the land surface um, in the land surface that we see. So where we had ice before, we now basically um, have this uh, green area, um, vegetated area. And these changes that we see on the land surface are also paralleled by changes below the ground in the soil. Um, however, um, these processes are maybe uh, less well understood than what we can actually uh, see with our eyes. So today I'm gonna focus on some of these uh, soil processes. So soils are uh, living systems that host um, a variety of chemical, biological, and physical processes that are all interlinked in complex ways. And soil processes are important for the provisioning of ecosystem services, as we already heard from Marco. And these services include, but are not limited to, element and nutrient cycling, water cycling and filtration, and neutralization, filtering, and buffering of pollutants. So understanding effects um, of climate change on these ecosystem services really requires that we shed light on these uh, processes that are occurring in these soil systems. So one type of chemical reactions that uh, play a role in many of these um, ecosystem services, as we'll see later, and that I'm particularly interested in are electron transfer or redox reactions. And so very generally, an electron transfer reaction involves the transfer of an electron from one element to another. And this is schematically shown here, where the orange uh, electron is transferred from an element A to an element B. And these electron transfer reactions are typically associated with a change in free energy of the system. So meaning that energy can either be um, released or captured in these reactions. And life as we know it, um, on Earth is only possible thanks to these electron transfer processes. So here is a simplified scheme of the electron cycle on the surface of the Earth. And it's powered by the energy of the sun, here is uh, HV, that is captured and transformed into chemical energy in photosynthesis. So photosynthesis involves a series of electron transfer reactions that result in the formation of um, this organic carbon, which then serves as nutrition for almost all other forms of life. And this chemical energy um, can then be used here in cellular processes in respiration where electrons are removed from organic carbon and transferred, um, for example, onto oxygen as shown here, uh, a process that um, regenerates water and CO2. So this respiration process here is shown for what we refer to as aerobic respiration, which uses oxygen. And this reaction also occurs in the cells of our bodies. And it also occurs in uh, soils, but there are some mi soil microorganisms that can also perform respiration reactions if oxygen is not present, as we will see later. 
So basically in a soil, as we heard from Marco, we have these inputs of um, carbon and typically this is also an input of energy, namely the energy that is captured by photosynthesis. This comes into the soil as plant and animal residues. And the micro or different organisms in the soil then continuously process this organic material that's coming in toward um, a smaller microbial size and gain energy through uh, these transformation processes. So microbial respiration is this last process in this um, de decomposition spectrum. And here we basically have the removal of electrons in orange from a hypothetical or from an organic carbon compound. And this electron is then transferred to an electron acceptor and CO2 is being produced. So as we heard from Marco before, this um, mineralization reaction is actually responsible for a large amount of the release of greenhouse gases from soils. So we're really interested in better understanding what controls this reaction here. So beyond carbon cycling, this reaction is also important, or microbial respiration is also important for the cycling of other elements that can serve as electron acceptors here. Um, and these can include nitrogen, iron, or sulfur. So let, let's take a closer uh, look at that. So um, as I said before, microorganisms cannot only use oxygen in respiration, they can also use other electron acceptors. So we already discussed oxygen uh, in one of the previous slides. So this is the electron acceptor that re releases the most energy when being reduced. So that means for a microbial community in a soil, they will typically use up oxygen first um, before they use another electron acceptor just because it's most energetically favorable. However, if there's um, no oxygen available, different mi microbial communities can use different electron acceptors. And these include uh, nitrate, as well as manganese and iron, which typically occur uh, in the form of soil minerals. And uh, some communities can also uh, reduce sulfate um, or uh, carbon. Um, but as we go down this so-called redox ladder, less and less energy is released in respiration processes that utilize these compounds as electron acceptors. So as you can see from these chemical, um, um, these uh, chemical components here, the microbial respiration reaction is not only relevant for the cycling of carbon, but also for the cycling of other elements that are shown here. So let's discuss a bit more about uh, where we can find these oxygen limited conditions. And in general, we see these conditions develop if the microbial consumption of oxygen is higher than the resupply of oxygen. And this is often the case in wet environments because the oxygen diffusion is much slower through water than through air. So we often see these anoxic conditions develop in environments such as uh, floodplains, as shown on the left here, or um, wetlands, as shown on the right. So in floodplains, um, we typically have, they can typically be submerged in water for a certain amount of time during the year. For example, if you look at a mountainous floodplain, as you can see here on this image, um, with snow melt, we basically get a rise in the water table of the river that can then um, flood part of the soil, leading to the development of these anoxic conditions. In wetlands, we typically have permanently waterlogged soils, and thus anoxic conditions are really common in these types of environments. However, these conditions not only um, form on larger scales, as we see here, but they can also occur on much smaller scales. And the reason um, is basically the same as, uh, or the reason for the formation of these conditions is the same as on larger scales, namely that we have higher rates of oxygen consumption than resupply rates of oxygen into um, a certain system. So in a soil aggregate, as um, shown here in these images, this can happen, for example, if some soil pores are water saturated and microorganisms have a lot of carbon available to consume in one zone of the aggregate, leading then to these higher oxygen consumption rates. So here for this example, we know that we have um, a heterogeneity of redox conditions because of the differences in these color variations that we see here. 
And these color variations are actually due to iron, which is one of the electron acceptors that microorganisms can use, if you uh, remember the redox letter from before. So basically in these um, brownish areas here, we have accumulation of iron minerals, whereas in these more grayish areas, we have depletion um, of iron because due to anoxic conditions and the dissolution of these minerals under um, anoxic conditions. So if you look closely at this image on the left, you see that many of um, these red areas are actually located around plant roots. And that's because some plants can um, basically bring oxygen through their roots into the soil, leading then to the precipitation of these um, minerals around plant roots. So in the remainder um, of this talk, I will focus on redox reactions involving um, iron minerals. And one example for an iron mineral is shown here. So this is a scanning electron microscopy image of magnetite. And as the name says, this mineral is magnetic. So all the individual crystals here um, arrange into um, chains because of the magnetic uh, nature um, of this mineral. So iron redox reactions are very important to consider because iron is one of the most abundant redox active, or it's actually the most abundant redox active metal in the Earth's, um, on the Earth's surface. And it therefore is pretty prevalent in many soils. Iron can undergo a wide variety of redox reactions that are important for the cycling um, of other elements, as well as for the mobility and toxicity of pollutants. So as you can see here on this simplified um, scheme, iron has two redox state, states, iron three and iron two. And so basically the addition of an electron to an iron three would result in the formation of an iron two. And iron three typically occurs as insoluble minerals, whereas iron two can either be dissolved, adsorbed um, onto soil surfaces, or be part of a mineral structure. So in general, this iron two is much uh, more mobile than iron three. This schematic here um, shows um, a range of different redox reactions that iron can participate in. And the detailed reactions here are not so important, but I want, what I want you, wanted to show you here is that there's many reactions that can involve microorganisms or um, not. So to orient um, you, this reaction that we talked about previously, microbial respiration um, using iron, is this um, reaction shown here in this um, blue rectangle. So many of these reactions actually tie the iron cycle to the cycling of other elements, such as carbon, as we discussed before, but also nitrogen um, or, or sulfur. So in addition to this complexity of redox reactions that iron can undergo, iron, inner, iron minerals can also transform over time, depending on the conditions that they are exposed to in the environment. And here I show you a few photos um, of soils that contain different types um, of iron oxides. On the left here, we have ferrihydrite, and that's a highly reactive mineral. So it forms these very small um, particles that are not super well defined. And it's actually the precursor for many of the other um, oxides that then form from ferrihydrite. It's also the most um, microbially available of the oxides. Then as a second example, we have goethite here in the middle picture. Goethite is found in all climatic zones, including here in soils in Switzerland. And it gives soils this yellowish color that you can see here in this image. Geotite forms much larger particles than magnetite. So here is a, an electron or a, a microscopy image of some geotite that was synthesized in the lab. And it forms these um, interesting needle-shaped crystals. Then as a last example, we have hematite here, which gives this, this soil here this reddish color. And hematite is very common in highly weathered tropical soils that we um, talked about before and forms these um, small diamond shaped um, particles. So all of these minerals have very different properties and they react differently in these various redox um, reactions that we discussed earlier. So some of my research focuses on finding ways to characterize these mineral properties. And so uh, in the last part of my talk, I want to show you one example 
of how we um, can assess these properties and learn something about these um, redox reactions involving iron. So uh, in this experiment here, um, I prepared an iron oxide in the laboratory, um, as shown here in this illustration in gray. And then basically I added iron reducing microorganisms to the system that I cultured in the lab. In addition, I also had some organic carbon for the microorganisms um, to use. So I basically incubated all these different components together in the lab and then followed the transfer um, of electrons to the mineral. So basically during the incubation, the microorganisms um, used this carbon as energy source, extracted electrons from the carbon and transferred it onto these mineral phases. I then used an experimental um, technique that allowed me to quantify the number of electrons that were transferred onto the mineral phase. And here is a photo of this experimental um, setup. So you can see um, eight so-called electrochemical cells here in this holder. And the sample is basically added to one of these small black crucibles, which contains a pH buffer solution. We then have uh, these electrons that are inserted into the solution and these uh, the electrodes, sorry. And th the electrodes are um, responsible for transferring the electrons to the sample and for monitoring the resulting flow of electrons to or from our sample. So if we go back um, to our experimental system, we can now characterize these samples by assessing how many electrons we can basically push into the sample or remove from the sample. So these blue traces here uh, represent the current that's, that results from pushing electrons into the sample. And the orange current shows the um, current that results from removing electrons from the sample. I show here uh, peaks for two time points. So this was at the beginning of the incubation when nothing really happened yet. And this was at the end of the incubation when microorganisms reduced part of the mineral phase. So basically what you can see here is at the beginning of the incubation, all electrons are located in the carbon and we actually don't see any response of the electrons in our system. So here, all our um, iron in our mineral was present in redox state three. Then as microorganisms reduced the iron over the course of the incubation, we saw an increase in this orange peak here, reflecting the production of iron two or the transfer of electrons um, to these minerals. So we can also analyze these peaks in more detail to then de determine the number of electrons that we have um, in the uh, mineral basically. And then we see a decrease and concurrent increase in these traces as we would expect. Uh, so basically with this, we can confirm that the microorganisms did transfer electrons from the carbon onto the minerals. And so um, this is just an example to show this methodology um, that we can use to quantify these electron transfer processes. And although I'm showing it um, here in an artificial system in the laboratory, we have other work um, where we um, also use a similar approach to characterize um, these electron transfer reactions in soil samples. So to conclude my talk, I wanna come back to the image that I showed you in the beginning. So I hope that I could show you that we really need to better understand processes that are occurring below the ground in, under, in order to understand effects of climate change on element cycling, as well as pollutant mm -hmm. dynamics and other ecosystem services that are provided by soils. And one important aspect in this regard are electron transfer processes, which as I showed you are um, integral part to some of these services. And so to assess the roles um, that soils play, play or can play, can play in climate change mitigation, as well as to predict the um, soil climate feedback that Mark had talked about earlier, it's important that we have a good understanding um, of these types of processes. Okay, with this, I'm at the end of my talk. Thanks so much for listening and I'm happy to take any question.